Hi, welcome back. We're going to be talking about loop invariance now. So this is a topic that was first introduced back in COM25, COM2010. And since that unit is a prerequisite for this one, I'm assuming that you know about it, or at least you have heard about it. Um, I understand that it's probably a hard topic. It's something that a lot of students couldn't really understand. And also something that a lot of students just ignore because, well, it didn't really show up in the final exam, maybe. So in this lecture, we're just going to talk about limb variants informally. Uh, just have a chat because I want you to understand what they are. Because next week, sorry, not next week, the next lecture, you're going to need it. Because we're going to be talking about um, how to use limb variants um, in proofing codes. So I have an informal definition up there, I'm just saying that a loop invariant is a statement about a loop that is true before and after each iteration. So you probably heard about this before, right? Um, it's something which is true before the loop starts. If it's true at the start of the iteration, it's true at the end of that iteration, and also true at the f uh, and then, um, at the end of the loop. So there's a formal definition there. That's from the textbook, I think. We don't, we're not going to be using this one for this lecture. Uh, we'll use this on the next lecture. Because for now, I just want you to have a feel of what a loop invariant is. So informally, a statement that is true before the first iteration, at the end of any iteration, if it's true at the start of the iteration, and also true at the end of the loop. So what do I mean by a statement? Um, so whatever statement you write, it's got to be relevant to what the loop is trying to do. Like, what is the purpose of the loop? And most of the time, uh, you can write the loop invariant to basically say what the loop is doing at every iteration. Okay, so remember, you got to write something which is relevant to the loop. So if you write something like Pikachu is an electric Pokemon, yeah, that's a correct statement. Um, it's always correct. You, you run your loop at any point in the loop. You finish your loop. You go to bed. That's still a true statement. But it's probably not going to be relevant to most loops that you write. Okay. So whenever you write a loop invariant, don't write something like that. Okay. Go find out what the loop is doing. Right. And construct something like or write something that is left relevant to what the loop is doing every iteration. But do you just write down what the, do you just explain what the loop is doing? Do you just write down every steps in the loop? No, you don't. That's not a loop invariant. But isn't that what I said in the previous slide? No, I didn't. Uh, no, I didn't. Go rewind, and you'll see that I did not say that. I did not did not I did not say that. You just write down uh, what the loop is doing. Because with the loop invariant. Yeah, um, you need to you need to have something in the loop invariant uh, more than just what the what the loop is doing. Of course, to write the loop invariant, you have to understand what the loop is doing. Sure, if you don't know what the loop is doing, if you don't know what the code is doing, there's no way you can write what the loop invariant is. But on the other hand, if you actually know what the loop is doing, most likely because you wrote the loop, then you probably know what the loop invariant is. Okay, uh, I have an example here. I hope that is pretty easy to understand. It's just um, exponentiation. I give you x, I give you n, then go worked out x to the n. We're gonna work with a very simple example. We're gonna, we're gonna talk about what the loop invariant is. Okay, so here are some choice answers. Like uh, I see these when I um, mark second year students. Like when they, when we ask them, uh, what what do you think is the loop invariant? So first one, the loop invariant is i less than n. No, that's not the loop invariant, that's the loop guard. Second one, i is always between 0 and n. Um, sure, but how is this relevant to what the loop is doing? Like, um, yeah, sure, i is between 0 and n, but that doesn't tell me anything. The loop computes x to the n. All right, that's what the loop does, but as I said before, this is not a loop invariant. And finally, ANS is x to the n. Well, that's getting close, 
that is kind of telling me what the loop is trying to do like what is the uh what is the purpose of this loop to find x to the n sure but that is still not the loop invariant so why is it not the loop invariant all right let me let me modify the uh let me modify the loop a little bit so instead of while loop i'm changing that into a for loop so really there's only one line that we have to care about it's line five so what is the loop doing there it's computing x to the n so, so why did i say this is not the loop invariant because that's not true at the start of the loop. As in the very beginning, before you before you enter the loop. What is n equal to? n equal to 1. That is not x to the n, right? Well, assuming x is not 1 and n is not 1. But I'll, I'll give you some value of x and some value of n. Then n is probably not equal to x to the n at the start. So a loop invariant. It's a statement that is relevant to what the loop is trying to accomplish here. Yeah. But because it's a loop, you're going to need several iterations before you get to um, the goal, before you compute what you need to compute. So in every iteration, you get closer and closer to the goal. So your loop variant, um, well, it's a statement, right? It can change after each iteration. So I put quotes there in change. Because it also progresses. Uh, you want to track the loop as you go. Like you want to track the progress of your loop with your statement. So answer equal to x to the n is not the loop invariant. The correct one is answer is equal to x to the i. Now ask yourself, is this true at the start of the loop? Yeah, it is. Because when you first start, what's i equal to? i is equal to 0. What's x to the power of 0? What's anything to the power of 0? You're going to get 1. And if this is true at the start of the iteration, is it also true at the end of that iteration? Now, this is something you have to prove. or well, something you have to argue, at least. Um, and the way we do it will be similar to the way we prove stuff by induction. So, let's do that properly. Um, so, I have it there that the loop invariant is ans equal to x to the i. Now, ask yourself, is that relevant to what the loop is trying to do? Well, yes, it is, because we're trying to compute x to the n. And if I have x to the i, uh, if answer is equal to x to the i, you can see that answer is where I'm trying to put my answer. Um, that's where I put my result as we progress. And you, cannot, you can kind of see that there's some progression here, because if answer is equal to x to the i, then you expect answer to change every time. So I said earlier that the uh, loop invariant kind of changes. Like it kind of tell you the progress. Um, it does because like I have i inside the statement, so i keeps on increasing, and this tells you that there's progress. So you uh, you're um, improving your answer all the time. But the actual invariant doesn't change. As in, you still have the same statement. What changes is the value of i and the value of n's. Now, not all the invariants will do this, but for the example, yeah, it does. Like um. The value of n and the value of x to the i will um, always change. Um, and now we can try to show the uh, property that this statement is always true everywhere. Well, not exactly everywhere, but um, at the start of the first iteration. Like, is it true? Well, at that point, i is equal to 0 and n is equal to 1. So, yeah, um, because anything power of 0 is equal to 1. That's correct. And this is the inductive step. So we're going to assume that this is correct. We're going to assume that um, uh, answer is equal to x to the k at the start of the iteration. So i equal to k and answer equal to um, x to the k. We assume this is correct. right? We assume that the uh, invariant is satisfied. So again, we have answer equal to x to the i. And then at the end of the iteration, what happened to ans? What happened to i? And what happened to the invariant? Well, at the end of the iteration, you're going to increase i by 1. All right, so i becomes k plus 1. And you're also going to multiply ns by x, that's in line 5. So ns become x to the k plus 1. So again, the loop invariant is still satisfied. Right? This is the statement which is always satisfied. And 
if you keep on satisfying the limit variant until the very end, until the end of the loop, then it will actually lead to um, you being able to prove that the code is correct. So we're going to do this more uh, in the next lecture. But at the very least, you can see now that um, when we finish the loop, i is equal to n, right? So answer is also equal to x to the power of n because of the limit variant. Okay, so the first three points, um, we have to show it. But the last point, that the very end, that's the consequence of the first three points being correct. So this is how you're going to prove that um, code with uh, loops um, is doing what they're supposed to be doing using a loop variant. So we're going to do more of this in the next video. Okay, so moving on to the next example. We got selection sort here. Uh, let's start with the first question. Like, what is the limit variant? Well, that's all we're going to talk about today. What is the limit variant? Always, what is the limit variant? Well, if you ask me that question, I'm going to go uh, which loop? Because as you can see, there are two loops here. You got the outer loops and you got the inner loops. Let us start with the inner loop. So what are we doing here? I hope it's pretty obvious that we're just looking for the uh, smallest element in the array. Well, actually, we are looking for the index of the smallest element. So we're going to say something useful about the, um, about the loop. Um, we need to put that in. We need to say that um, somehow we're looking for the smallest element. And maybe something that's useful is uh, where do you put the result of what we're doing? Like, where do you put the index of the smallest element? And obviously, that's in the uh, variable min index, right? So in our loop invariant, we have to have that. We should put min index in there somewhere. And we should also say that we're looking for the smallest element in the array. OK. So how's this for the, um, for the first attempt? Min index is the index of the smallest element in R. OK. So that, that is saying that we're looking for the smallest element in the array R. Now, I hope you see a problem here, because what is R? R here is like the whole array, but we're not going through the whole array. We're just going from index i up to index n minus 1, right? So that's a good try. That limit variant is a good try. Um, but that's not the right answer. How about this one? Mean index is the index of the smallest element. Uh, inside r from index i up to index n minus 1. So that notation there, um, brackets i dot dot n minus 1, that's just saying I I don't want the whole array. It's not the whole array, but it's just the array from index i up to index n minus 1. So what do you think about that one? Getting close? Well, at least now we have i as well inside the limit variant. And if you remember from the uh, previous example, having i, um, having i in there is good. Because it shows you progress. It shows you, uh, it lets you see that the loop is getting closer and closer to the answer. Except that this time, i doesn't actually change. If you look at the uh, loop again, the index that changes is actually j. All right? We're not changing i at all. i changes on the outer loop if you look at the uh, whole um, code. But in this inner loop, only j actually changes. And in fact, even if I was the index, um, what I have there is uh, what I have there is uh, min index is the index of the smallest element in the whole array, in the whole section of the array that we're looking for. And that's just wrong because um, when we first start off, we don't know that we don't know that um, we don't know what the smallest element is when we start off. So that statement cannot be true at the beginning of the uh, loop. Okay, last one. Min index is the index of the smallest element in R from i up to j minus 1. So yeah, that's pretty good. That's the best one so far. And I claim that that is the loop invariant. Because you are looking for these index of the smallest element in that array. And you're looking at the array from i up to j minus 1. And j will 
progress, J will keep on increasing until eventually it hits N. Right, and when it hits N, you are looking at the array from I up to N minus one. In other words, you are looking at the whole array. Okay. So let's scrutinize this a bit more. Um, is this statement true at the start of the loop? So when at the beginning we say that j equal to i plus one, right? And min index is equal to i. So the statement reads min index is the index of the smallest element in R i i. I mean that's just an array with one element with index i. So of course, like if there's only one element in the array, then index i is the smallest element. Alright, so at the start of the loop, at the very beginning, this statement is correct. Alright, so check one. Now the second one. Let's assume that the statement is true at the start of one iteration. So at the iteration when j is equal to k, we can assume that the uh, statement is correct. So it reads, mean index is the index of the smallest element in R from i up to k minus 1, right? Because we said j is equal to k. So um, we have array i up to k minus 1. Is this statement true at the end of the iteration? Well, in that iteration, what are we doing? We look at the array k, like element k, right? We're going to check if it's smaller than the element at um, min index. And if it is, we keep track of that. We, we, we change min index to become k. So at the end of it, we're going to have min index um, to be the index of the, most, um, the smallest element from r i up to r k. Okay? And that's good because uh, at the end of the iteration, we also increase j by 1. So j is now k plus 1. So we increase j by 1. We also increase the uh, array by 1 because we look at one more location. So in fact, the statement is still true. Mean index is still the index of the, of the smallest element in R, I, up to J minus 1. Good. Finally, at the very end, what happens? Um, well, because the uh, loop invariant is maintained all the time, at the very end, it will still also be true. And at the very end, we have j equal to n, right? That's that's what happens just before um, uh, we stop the loop. j will be equal to n. So the loop invariant will read mean index is the index of the smallest element in r, i, up to n minus 1. And that is exactly what we're looking for. Okay, so the loop invariant is telling me that, yeah, I got the answer. Mean index is the answer. It is the index of the smallest element um, in the array i up to n minus 1. So great. This is just showing to me that the loop actually does work. Okay. So let's now go back to the um, outer loop. Let's go back to the whole code. What are we doing here? We are doing selection sort. So what's a good loop, loop invariant for this one? So we want to say something useful, we want to say something relevant to the loop, um, and since we are sorting the loop, we probably want to say the word array and the word sort in there somewhere. So how about the first one, how about the first one there? Um, how about if I say that the loop invariant is just, the array is sorted. So hopefully by now, you got enough experience, you can say that, nope, that's wrong. Because obviously, uh, at the start of the loop, that is wrong. Because we don't have the whole array sorted at the start. How about the second one? The array is sorted up to index i. That sounds much better, right? But you also learned from the uh, previous examples that you got to be precise. Like, index i or i minus 1. And what is the name of the array? It's called r. So we, you should have that word. You should have the um, variable name, which is r. A double r. And this is what, su what I suggest as the loop invariant. The array r from 0 up to i minus 1 is sorted. Is this true at the start? 
is the array uh, from zero up to i minus one sorted? Well, in the beginning, i is equal to zero. So you're looking at the array from zero up to minus one. So in this case, just um, as a convention, if you see arrays from zero up to minus one, that's just an empty array. So this is uh, trivially true because we got an empty array, it's sorted. <clears throat> now look at the second one. Let's just assume this is true at the start of the iteration. So we assume that the array um, from zero up to k minus one is sorted. Um, will it be true at the end of that iteration? We have the array from zero up to k sorted. Hopefully you're gonna say yes. Because um, if you look at the code, um, that's all we're doing is we increase i by one, obviously. And then we also look for the smallest element um, um, from k onwards. And then we put that into k. So we're going to have elements from k, k plus 1 up to n minus 1, right? We look for the smallest element. That's what the uh, inner loop is doing. And finally, we place that on k. So yeah, that loop invariant is still correct at the end of the iteration. The problem is, when you get to the very end, the invariant is going to say the array from 0 up to n minus 2 is sorted. So it's saying nothing about n minus 1. Why? Well, well, see at the end there, um, look at uh, line 2. My loop goes from i equal to 0 up to i less than n minus 1. So actually the last value that i takes is not n, it's actually n minus 1. And that makes the loop invariant actually wrong. Right. So um, I'm actually not going to discuss this here because um, we're going to talk about this in the next uh, video. Um, what we have so far is pretty good. Like the um, the final loop invariant, the correct one, is pretty close to what we have so far. But it's just missing something. And I thought this is a bit advanced. Then we just do it in the next um, in the next video. Okay. So that's it. I hope you had enough of loop invariants by now. Um, well, I hope you get some more experience on loop invariants. If you want more practice, you can also go to the textbook, um, read up the uh, relevant chapters on loop invariant, and yeah. Um, it should be good to go to the next video then we when we talk about looping fairing some more all right i'll see you in the next video